So Adam, thank you for being here, and we look forward to your presentation. Uh, Nathan, if I'd known that you were going to mention where I was going after this, I wouldn't have told you what my, what my meeting was. But no, I, I am really grateful to be here. Um, Nathan is a good friend, and I was very gracious to extend the invitation to come be here with you all today. I've had the honor of also being in this room uh, at previous meetings, and so I know um, the value that this provides, and again, just grateful grateful to be here. So thank you again to Nathan and the Oklahoma Bus Business Ethics Consortium for the invitation um, to be here with you all today. So um, as Nathan said, I thought I, it would be a good use of our time just to kind of talk a little bit about my background, how I got to where I am today, and the work that I get to take part in today, and then spend most of our time talking about the issues that I believe we face as a community and as a state in terms of our criminal justice system and the issues that many of us in this room are working towards changing. Uh, and again, after that nation, Nathan and I will have a discussion and then as, as you've talked at your tables and as you uh, hear me talk for a few minutes here, I would, I'd love for you to think, think about it, maybe even write down some questions because we will leave some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, so as Nathan mentioned, I uh, grew up in Broken Arrow. I had a good family, relatively uneventful upbringing. Uh, it wasn't until I was an adult that I understood the breadth of my parents' experience, uh, as usually happens in your 20s, and just how much work they had done to provide me with the upbringing that I had. Um, my mother and father came from broken homes where substance use and trauma were very common. Together they experienced homelessness, periods of jail time, failed marriages, abuse, and I'm sure other things that I'll probably never learn of. Um, by the grace of God and from church and with community, my parents were able to create an environment where I would never know many of these things. I would never know the smell of alcohol, never feel the sting of their hand in anger, never wonder where they were when I woke up or went to sleep. All things and sensations that they knew all too well growing up. So it was because of this environment that I had a good enough sense to know that I needed to do something after high school. My dad said, you're not staying here when you turn 18, and so I enlisted in the military at the age of 17. I uh, spent five years, as uh, Nathan mentioned, as a linguist in the Air Force, three of those years serving overseas in South Korea, and came back um, to finish college and spent four years finishing college and going to grad school, had our first two sons. Um, mentioned all that to say we got to a certain point in life where we were trying to figure out where we wanted to settle down. And my wife and I both, having been from Oklahoma and, and lived around other places, as I'm sure many of you shared this experience, <laughs> said, I'm never going to come back to Oklahoma, like famous last words, right? But, um, there are some things, as many of you all know, you know, Oklahoma has that many other places in the world just can't offer. And we came back for a summer where I had an opportunity to work for Governor Fallon through a fellowship that paired graduate students with state governor's offices across the country. And Governor Fallon's office said, hey, we need some help looking at our criminal justice system. I had no background in criminal justice, really no understanding of what was happening in our state, despite having a, a family background that involved uh, interactions with the criminal justice system. And so for me, it was a new experience. I spent three months meeting with as many people as I could who had been impacted by the criminal justice system, who were involved in working in the criminal justice system. Um, and it was a very enlightening experience for me. Um, and before I move forward, I, I just want to give the caveat that a lot of these things are my personal opinion. These, uh, I share a little bit about my background and experience because I think so much of, as we talked about at our table, the views on justice and mercy is so shaped by your personal experience. Um, and I think as many people as there are in this room, there were as many definitions of justice and mercy. And so that's the only caveat that I give that I, I will never share the experiences of many people actually in this room who have been impacted by crime. I'll never share experiences of people who have been involved in the justice system. And so I ask that you just give us grace as we move through this conversation together, knowing that I don't pretend to know it all, um, but I do have some experience that I want to share with you all today. So going back, you know, that three months that I had was the first time that I ever went into a prison. First time that I ever looked at a fellow community member through the door of a jail cell. Um, had a, a hard time going to sleep that night. I was exposed to many things that I had simply never been exposed to before. Um, that exposure to me highlighted what I quickly was realizing was a disparity between what I said I believed, not only as a member of this community, but as a person of faith, and what was actually happening in the place that I grew up, the place that I wanted to call home, the place that I wanted to raise my family. That exposure to things caused me to really wrestle with a lot of these ideas, um, a lot of these barriers that I had put up in my life, a lot of these definitions of what I thought justice was, 
a lot of definitions about what a crime is and what constitutes a crime and what do you do to somebody who's committed a crime. I was beginning to wrestle with these things. That wrestling to me led to a desire to understand the broader picture and the deeper policies that led to the systems that we have in Oklahoma that at the time led us to have the highest female incarceration rate in the world and uh, shortly after that the highest male incarceration rate in the world, meaning that we put a larger percentage of our population in Oklahoma in prison than any other place in the world, more than Brazil, more than Iran, more than Cuba, in fact, more than those three countries combined. And so for me, it was, um, it was an eye-opening experience. The education that I pursued after that, the knowledge that I pursued, the understanding I pursued of what was happening, helped me understand maybe what are some potential paths for you'll find comfort in just as I did, knowing that we're not the first place, we're not the first community to wrestle with these issues. There are other states and other places in the world that have worked on the same things that we're wrestling with right now and have made tremendous strides. Um, and so I started researching and started looking into that and talking with other people in the community about how we might do that. The last thing that happened that summer was I, I left that three-month experience in Oklahoma with a sense of hope. So it was my first time that summer that I interacted with the Remerge program and had an opportunity to go to one of the graduations where uh, Remerge is a, a diversionary program for mothers who are facing incarceration in Oklahoma. Had an opportunity to go to a graduation where 15 moms were graduating that, that just that one day. Um, between those 15 moms, they had 34 minor children under the age of 18. Seven of those women were facing a life sentence in prison for nonviolent drug-related convictions. The other eight women had a combined 99 years of incarceration ahead of them. And here they were that day, graduating from this program. After 18 to 24 months, on average, every single one of them had at least one job. Every single one of them had transportation and housing. And for the first time in most of their lives, all 34 of those kids were going back into custody with their parents and not into DHS. And so sitting there that day and Having spent that summer looking at what was happening in our state and getting to compare that to something like Remerge, I was forced to come to terms with a couple things. One, and, and I think foremost, was the outcomes. So what's the difference between sending somebody to a program like Remerge where they get the treatment that they need, maybe for the first time in their life they have an opportunity both physically and mentally to process the trauma they've experienced in life and get the treatment that they actually need. Uh, what are the outcomes and how do you compare those two? So, Having uh, now spent, uh, spent three years on the Board of Corrections, I've been to every prison in the state, talked with correctional officers and educators and case managers and service providers in every prison in the state, I know that at the end of the day, the thing that we are preparing individuals in Oklahoma who are incarcerated most for is to come back to prison. Given the constraints that we have on our budget, how few staff we have, how overworked they are, how much overtime they're spending, how few resources we have for classes, Given the constraints we've had and the number of people we've incarcerated over the last 30 years and the disproportionate amount that our budget has grown in comparison to that growth, we just don't have much resources left. And so comparing the outcomes, you have to ask the question, what would have happened if they had, if they had been incarcerated? What condition would they have been released in? Would they have had a job? Would they have had a car? Would they have had transportation? Then you get to things that you really can't calculate. Like, what would have happened to those 34 kids? What condition would they have been in after those years of their mother being away? And you can't calculate those things, they're incalculable. But then you can get to things that you can calculate, right? So what would have been the cost if they had been incarcerated? So just on the conservative end of the sentence ranges of those 15 women, it would have cost us as taxpayers, as a community, the state of Oklahoma, $1.5 million just to incarcerate them. So then we compare that to the cost of the Remerge program, and they know hard costs for those 15 women, it cost $364,000 for them to graduate with a 6% recidivism rate over the last eight years of the program, which is a third, almost a third of what it is, state female individuals coming out of incarceration in Oklahoma. And so for me, coming away from that experience, I had a tremendous sense of hope that it didn't have to be this way. We could do things differently, and not only could we, but we actually were. There were these beacons of, of light in Oklahoma where things were happening differently, and we could do it differently too. So after I went back uh, to Boston, finished my second year of graduate school, we did, we moved back in 2015. I spent the next couple years working with the governor's office to implement many of the things that we talked about. I spent the next three years in the State Board of Corrections, again, going to every, every prison in the state. Um, and then after Governor Stitt was elected, I had the opportunity to come and, and be on the partner parole board and uh, have spent this month, next week is our, our next meeting. Uh, it'll be a year that I've, I've been on the board. Um, 
And I wanted to talk a little bit about that experience, and I think uh, that will be informative for the conversation we have moving forward with Nathan and maybe the questions that you all have. But um, the mission of this board is to serve the citizens of Oklahoma by making careful and informed decisions, focusing on public safety, offender accountability, reentry, and victim rights. So that's in, in idealistic terms. The mission statement, that's a lot of words, but in technical terms, what that means is we are the group of five people tasked with looking at individuals on the back end of the system and trying to decide, are they ready to get out? So we look at every single parole, every single pardon, and every single commutation, which is a form of relief for individuals whose sentences are excessive or their sentence has uh, been changed by a change in law, which we've experienced quite a bit of, of over the last few years. This board also conducts clemency hearings prior to any scheduled execution in the state of Oklahoma where we hear from the defense and from the prosecution and from the individual um, once their execution date is set and decide we're the last opportunity for relief before they go before the governor to move forward with their execution. So in the past year, just to share a little bit about my experience on this board, um, I feel like before this experience over the last year, I, as much as I knew about what was happening in our state, I think in many ways it feels today like I was still seeing it black and white. And through my experience on the Pardon and Parole Board, I see many different shades of color now than I did previously. So through thousands of cases, you know, going into it, I thought I thought it was going to be maybe 40% over here where, you know, the definite yes, the blacks, the definite no's, the whites, and in between there was going to be maybe that 20% of gray area. And in fact, it's been quite the opposite. And it didn't take me very long to realize that. But these decisions, when forced to make them on the back end, are actually a lot harder to make. Um, and in fact, they're far costlier and it's far riskier to make these decisions on the back end than what many states are doing now, which is trying to make these decisions on the front end where we decide, is incarceration the right fit for this person? Could they be better served somewhere else? Are there alternatives to incarceration that may cost us less, provide better outcomes, and improve public safety? Um, so it's been a, a pretty eye-opening experience. Um, we have begun making significant progress in implementing national best practices on the board, which has been good. We've streamlined processes and done our best to deal with an already tremendous and even growing caseload number of cases that we're seeing. Um, in addition to these reforms, we've also increased the parole grant rate for the board, which is the number of individuals we move from either, if it's a nonviolent offense, we have the authority to grant them parole. If it's a violent offense, then it goes to the governor, where he ultimately makes that decision. So we've increased that rate by 255% just in the last year, over 2018. Uh, the number of cases that we've reviewed has also increased significantly. The overall grant rate was 47% in 2019 compared to 28% in 2018. The number of cases we reviewed was 3,314 in 2019 compared to 2,382 in 2018. Um, I think in particular of note has been the commutations. And this is a little bit in the weeds, but uh, indulge me for a second. So we've changed a tremendous amount of laws in the last two years. We passed state question 780 and 781. There was a, a bill that went through the legislature last year, 1269, that made 780 retroactive. So now you have to consider we have many individuals, and in fact at the time it was thousands of individuals, incarcerated in Oklahoma for a crime if they had committed today would not require incarceration. So what do you do with that? Commutation was the only avenue for relief. So we reviewed 3,332 commutation applications in 2019 compared to just 634 in the entire year of 2019. So again, while we're making significant progress on this end of the uh, criminal justice system, I, I believe that we won't experience long-term sustainable change until we talk about a long-term strategic plan that allows us to both improve public safety and better use our scarce resources to address the needs of our communities. So this is where I believe much credit is due to Governor Stitt for leveraging his position as governor to not only start working and begin and continue working on an issue that is not always popular for a governor to talk about, especially a first-term governor, to leverage that influence and the resources that are available to him in his first term, what many would say is a honeymoon period. So if you're a new governor, you've got a year, maybe 18 months to get done the things that are most important to you. He's begun talking about this. Um, but he's also exercised his position of leadership to facilitate, I would say, conversations within the community that we have not had previously. And there are conversations that really can only be facilitated by someone in this position. So I'm grateful to him for that. Uh, we talk about a long-term plan, and so you know, at many points in this conversation, it's you look at the size of the problem, you look at, uh, as I have over the last year, just how entrenched 
so many of these cycles are. You talk about education and addiction and abuse and incarceration, you know, all these societal ills. When you, when you stare at that gap, that disparity between what we say we believe and how those beliefs are played out, whether it be as a, a member of a faith community or just a member of this community, it's, it's rough. I mean, it, it, sometimes it just feels insurmountable. And you just ask, like, what do you do? How does this ever change? And it's taken generations to get to where we are today. How do we ever work our way out of this? Um, and that's where I've just said, I don't, I don't want to leave you with that sense of despair. I want to leave you with a sense of hope to know that it can happen and that it is happening. That change is happening right now. I believe that to the extent we're able to accomplish this change in the, in the long term, it will be in direct, directly correlated with how much time and attention we put into a long-term plan. So we've got to, as, as in many things that we work on as a community, we've got to insulate this policy process, this long-term strategic planning process where we get all these stakeholders around the table, we've got to insulate that process from what I would call the political pressures of a year-to-year -year legislative cycle. I think that's just the reality. I don't think that many positions of elected leadership are necessarily incentivized to take positions of substance on any issues of controversy. That's an unpopular opinion, but I think it's true. Um, I think that we've got to acknowledge the constraints that come with trying to address a long-term systemic problem with year-to-year -year legislative fixes or state questions. It's just really hard to make progress when you do it that way. Um, you compare it to business or nonprofit work. If you're talking about a long-term goal, you don't set, you don't take 10-year goals and say, how do we get this done this year? You say, how do we work towards this for the next five years? And I believe that's that's kind of the inflection point that we're at right now. We've got more public support, more public awareness, more resources. Um, we've got a governor who's exercising more leadership on this, on this issue than any governor in recent memory. And I think we're at an apex moment where we've really got to capture that momentum and some vehicle that allows us to talk about a long-term strategic plan because it's not just individuals who are incarcerated we're talking about, it's public safety. And this is an issue that could not be more important These our lives potentially at stake. We've got to be very careful about this. We've got to be very thoughtful about this. We've got to follow proven evidence-based models to get us to where we need to go. Um, but I am confident that for however long it takes us to work towards a system that is just, a system as we've talked about today that balances accountability with mercy, treatment with punishment, reconciliation with wrongs, I'm confident that this community, the people and many of us who are in this room today, will work together to make that happen. Again, we're not the first ones to, to struggle with this. We're not the first ones to work on this. Um, so I'll end my prepared comments there. And, and uh, Nathan and I have talked about a few questions that we thought might be helpful to talk about today, but also wanted to leave some time to open it up to, to questions should you have any. So again, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I look forward to the discussion with Nathan. We could have a great business in Oklahoma but they look at the numbers and they say, look, look at where you are on things like the number of people you have uh, incarcerated. This is not something that we can um, step aside on. We have to think about this. What, what do you think the, the role of uh, businesses, nonprofits, schools can be in helping address this? That's a good question. Uh, I think that's just a really hard truth, and I think the best way to start that, and, and it, it's actually quite a bit of work, is just to acknowledge that there's a problem. And, and the reality that we have more churches than any community our size in the world. We have more nonprofits, we have more businesses led by people of faith than almost any place in the world, and yet by any metric that you would judge how well a society is doing or whether or not a community is flourishing, we are last. In the things that we should be first in, and first in the things that we should be last in. And that's, that's hard. And I think even just getting to that point where we as a community are able to acknowledge that truth, and whether or not we participated in creating these problems, if we're able to come to a place where we own it, and say, I'm going to be a part of the solution, I think that's, that's a lot of the work right there. I believe that when an individual or an organization or a company can come to that place where we where we begin to, as a community, come under the weight. What does it look like to have a community where those there's so much disparity between what we say we believe and how those beliefs are played out that, that we'll get really uncomfortable with that weight. And that over time, we will grow increasingly uncomfortable in our comfort. And whatever our passions are, whatever our abilities are, whatever our resources are, whatever our talents are, whatever our business is, over time, given that discomfort at the first opportunity to do something about it, 
whether it's hire somebody or start a business or volunteer or give, we will do it. And we will do it over and over and over again. Much more so than if somebody were to say to us, hey, here's what you've got to do. You've got to vote for this thing or vote for this person or pass this state question or write a check to this place or volunteer here. I believe the work is much longer term than that. And I think that we've got to become, I think we've got to get used to being uncomfortable and as a community together realize that when, when enough of us get to a place where we're really uncomfortable with where we're at, things will start to happen. A few uh, weeks or months ago, I was uh, watching TV national news and Oklahoma uh, comes on there and, and it's talking about this historic day in Oklahoma and it pertains specifically to what you're doing in, in, your, in the parole board and in that. Can you, can you tell more about what that day was about? Yeah, absolutely. So I mentioned it just for a second earlier that we had a lot of laws that changed in the state of Oklahoma. A lot of them had to do with drug possession. So uh, many places in the country, it's not a felony to have drugs. And in Oklahoma, drug possession uh, at the time didn't really have a threshold. So there's, there's really no threshold for that. There's no threshold for possession with the intent to distribute. Um, and again, these are kind of the, the vague areas in statute and law that, that in aggregate lead us to having the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, so an example of that is uh, another law that was changed during that time was a property crime threshold. So really what that's describing is what's the difference between a misdemeanor property crime and a felony property crime. Misdemeanor comes with time in county jail, a fine, a felony comes with time in state prison and uh, a higher fine and you, you're now a convicted felon which means harder to get a driver's license, it's harder to get a job, go check a box, it's harder to get housing, you know, all these things that, that many of us know and work in. Um, and that property crime threshold in 2001 was $50 in the state of Oklahoma. In 2001, that property crime threshold to five, changed to $500. State question 788 and 781, there was a bill that passed the same year, changed it to $1,000. So that's where it stands today. Over that same period of time in the state of Texas, that threshold has been and is today $2,500. So that group of people, Texas says, you know what, that yes, they committed a crime, they probably need to be in county jail, maybe they need some kind of treatment, let's have a conversation about that, but ultimately, we need to reserve these beds in prison for people who we are legitimately afraid of that have our, our risk of public safety and we need to keep them in prison. And, and that's the difference between a, a state like Texas who over the last 15 years has closed nine prisons. Last year had the lowest violent crime rate, property crime rate they've had since 1968 saved close to $3 billion, you know, and they were looking at building new prisons back in 2005. So all that to say, you know, all those laws changed. Um, we did, uh, as a result of the, 12, the state bill that passed 1269, we were, as a board, instructed to figure out what to do with all these people who were still incarcerated for a crime that if they committed today wouldn't carry a period of incarceration. And so that's what we did. Um, director Steve Bickley had just been hired as the executive director of the Department of Parole Board and we had very straightforward instructions from the governor that was get this done, make sure that you do it in a, in a way that is deliberative, um, with public safety at the for, forefront of our thinking. And uh, it was a five month long process working with four different state agencies and you know close to 40, I think it was 47 nonprofits doing all these fairs across the state, getting individuals ready to transition. And ultimately ended up with, um, uh, I believe the final number was 392 individuals who were commuted on one day, which ended up being the largest single day commutation in United States history. And um, so that was that was what that, that vote was about and I was you know, really grateful to be a part of that and um, play some, some role in that. But that was really just the beginning of the work. Right. So now we've got this huge group of individuals who are now in the community and we're working alongside them to help make sure that they've got jobs and housing and transportation and mm -hmm. making sure that there is a successful reintegration back into the community. Um, and it was very instructive for us as a state and community of nonprofits and state agencies to figure out how do we do this work longer term where it's not just focused on one day, but how are we doing this work for the one individual that's getting out today where, you know, a year ago they would have been given twenty dollars in a bus pass. You know, what does it look like for us as a community to say, hey, what do you need and how can we provide you with those services based on where you want to go back to? Trying to show a mercy because we're doing life together. When you think about your views on mercy as it pertains to your life as a nonprofit leader, uh, your your life working with uh, people. How do you how do you see mercy in the workplace? What's the role of mercy in the workplace? Yeah, um, I think somebody on our table said that mercy was um, 
getting what you don't deserve, or getting what you, or not getting what you do deserve. I can't remember which one it was. Um, my again, my my experience has been very deeply shaped by my experience working in the criminal justice system, um, interacting with individuals who've been impacted by crime, working with individuals and in, in relationship with individuals who have been impacted by the criminal justice system. And uh, you know, I mentioned it in the beginning. I think that there are as many dif different definitions of mercy and justice as there are individuals who you would ask that question to. It's really hard to nail down what exactly. Does that look like? Um, but for me, what it's come down to, and I think my work that I that I have the privilege of doing in the community is is facilitating conversations and bringing light to the idea that um, many of us are living in a system that we may not have created explicitly, but by our action or inaction, we are perpetuating. And I think as a community, we've got to we've got to come to an agreement on what is justice, what is mercy, what does it mean for, uh, and even ask the questions. Well, they're they're a criminal; they committed a crime. Are we even sure that we agreed that what they actually did we would also define as crime? So just because it's always been defined as crime doesn't mean does that mean that it should always be defined as crime? I think we can all think of things that today we look back 50 years ago and, and we cannot even fathom how somebody called that a crime. And so I think we've got to look forward 50 years from now and say, how will history judge us? And can we take that lens and look at our communities today and come to an agreement and say, are there things that we would say are a crime today that maybe, maybe actually they, they did something wrong, yes, but what was the root of that criminal behavior? Was it something related to a substance use disorder or a diagnosed mental illness or a domestic violence situation? or an experience of homelessness, or something related to poverty, something that we could say, if we were to address some of those root causes, maybe these things up here wouldn't become such an issue. That's a lot of words just to say that I think it's helpful to have those conversations internally. So have you as an organization ever sat down and said, let's have a conversation, maybe it's just your leadership team, what does it look like for us as an organization to say we are merciful? How do we define that? in our local context of this organization, what does it mean when somebody does something wrong? How do we approach that? So for City Care, it's, it's not written down anywhere, but if you were to ask anybody on the leadership team, we would say that when something happens, we confront and love. Confrontation is going to happen, but we have a commitment to one another, and from me all the way from, from actually from our board, all the way down to Jan, who's starting this week um, as a driver for us, she's going to know that when there is an issue, someone's going to talk about it. It's going to be done in love. And, and the responsibility on the other side of that is to accept that confrontation in humility. And we believe that if you can do those two things, you'll be able to work through any problem. But I just use that as an example to say that that's a conversation we've had. And if as an organization you've never had that conversation, what does it mean to be ethical here? What does it mean to be merciful here? What does it mean to work with integrity here? If you've never had that conversation, then have it. Have it with your leadership team. And then figure out what does that look like, what are some core values that we can put some words to, and then how do we have that conversation with our different teams, how do we empower our team leaders to go and have those conversations with their teams, so that maybe, you know, it's taken us three years, but maybe, maybe it is three years from now we get to a place where you can go to any person in your organization and say, what does it look like when something wrong happens in your team, and they're able to say the same thing across the board. Um, that's been a goal of ours, and, and that's something that, you know, you're always working towards, but I think just getting those conversations and acknowledging that we all come to this with different ideas of what mercy and justice looks like, but let's start a conversation and see if we can come to some agreement on that. No, I, I really uh, want um, us as a group to contemplate what he just said, of what does it mean to decide to be a place known for mercy. And I was uh, talking to Adam about this when we were preparing for this. My brother was shot uh, twice in August and nearly died in a botched robbery was in a coma uh, for a week, uh, and I stood there at his bed watching him uh, labor, trying to stay alive, and he's an a inner city school principal in Little Rock. He's uh, one of the, the people who's trying to make a difference, and he came out of that, he survived, um, and my brother, one of the first things he said was, uh, we live in a system that is that is messed up. That this 
this kid didn't wake up one day and decide he wants to be this. This is the consequence of a system that has failed him. And he was much more gracious about it than I was. Because I struggled with it. And then they uh, caught the guy about a month ago. And my brother sends me a picture of the guy. And I'm struggling with it. And I want to be a forgiving person, and I thought I was. And I'm struggling with it. At the same time, my daughter uh, attends the uh, university I went to uh, over in Arkansas, where there was a young man named Botham Jean, who down in Dallas uh, went into the, uh, he was in his uh, apartment that evening, and an off-duty officer came in to the wrong floor, and you know the story, uh, killed this young man who was a, uh, a bright star, a, a um, exceptional uh, person. And so he watched this, and then there's that moment where he receives, uh, she receives some form of justice. You're going to be sent to prison. And then Botham's brother, who is my daughter's classmate now, asks, could he hug her? And she walks up and he hugs her and he says, I forgive you. And that has messed with my head ever since. Because he was instructive to me. That's how you could do it. And on some days I'm close, but on a lot of days I'm not. So when we talk about being merciful, what do you think the obstacles are for us to be able to let go of some of that and show mercy to people who do not deserve it? I'm going to get your response to that, then I'm going to open up for questions from the audience and look forward to hearing your questions. But I want you to, to, to think, what are the obstacles that might need to be removed in an organization where they might have a heart of mercy towards one another, um, towards the people that they serve, etc.? What is your opinion on that? That's a hard question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we started at our table and Nathan turned to me and said, all right, I need to go first. And I said, no, I already signed up to talk this. this is <laughs> um, I think probably a year ago I would have said something different. I think today I can say that we have to be really, really careful with how we have these conversations the broad brushes we often paint, and we have to acknowledge with profound humility and grace mm -hmm. that there are people for whom this conversation is not possible. And to mm -hmm. expect them to understand or engage in this conversation is, I would say, unfair. We have to let people work through what they need to work through on their own time, in their own context, and whatever that looks like for them without any bar for what it means to be a person of grace, to be a person of mercy. And I think that we all have to come to that place where we're willing to offer each other that kind of grace and mercy. Um, so there's really no easy answer, but I think that's the big caveat. I think from there, uh, it really is case by case, and that's what I've learned is that the reason, you know, 60%, maybe more than that, of, of these cases that I've had the opportunity to work on are so many different shades of gray is because you have to consider so many different factors that are so dependent upon the person. So what does it mean to balance public safety and justice and uh, risk with someone's capacity for change, or demonstrated progress, or you know, education, or any of these other, what we would say are like mitigating factors. And it's, it is all so dependent on that person. And so that's where I feel like it's just so helpful to have some kind of framework. Because if you don't have a framework, and whether it's as a board as we are of five people, or an organization of 500, you're all starting from different places that begin where your experience, your life, your hurts and your pains or your victories place you at this starting point. And I think the framework allows us to all create a space 
in time to acknowledge that. I think that's really the getting work is acknowledging that we're all coming to these concepts of justice and mercy and integrity from different places. And if we can acknowledge that, then we can start to have a conversation about where do we want to be ultimately as an organization and how can we honor each individual's journey to that point. Because for some, that journey to that point of what it means to exercise mercy or grace is going to be a lot longer than someone else's. And so I think for us, just having that framework has been really helpful. And again, I think once you have that framework, then you can then you can take specific situations and apply it within that framework. So you can say, well, here's what happened, but here's what we've all previously agreed it means to be an, an organization of integrity or an organization of mercy, an organization that fights for justice or is working towards justice in our community. Now let's take this situation and apply this framework to it. And all of a sudden, instead of starting from different continents, you're all starting from the same neighborhood block. And all of a sudden, what it looks like to reach that destination together seems like it's a lot more straightforward. And, and the things required in terms of conversations or resources or whatever the case may be are a lot clearer than if you're starting from, from vastly different places. Thank you. All right, questions. I see a hand back here, uh, from sort of over here. I don't have a microphone, or I can run to you. So the question uh, at the heart of it is, when someone has uh, broken trust with their behavior for whatever reason, and now we are trying to do life together, but we know where they have been, uh, how do we move forward when we know that uh, they're capable of something that, that we've experienced and has hurt us perhaps in the past? Yeah, so it's a, it's a question that comes up a lot. It's a good question, so thank you for asking. I think it starts with an acknowledgement that individuals, simply put, are more than the worst decision they've ever made. Certainly, if people knew the worst decisions that I have ever made, I probably wouldn't be sitting on the stage. And I think that for the individuals that we get to work with, be in community with, or for a business owner, the individuals that you get to hire, that moment in time was probably the worst time of their life. It was the worst decision of their life. And the amount of things that they have done to come from that place are far, far greater than what happened in that specific instance. So I think it begins with really small things like the words that we use. So I, uh, and I, and I know in culture today, it's really hard to understand like, what's the right word to use and how do you talk about this and all that stuff, which I would just say, you know, again, just meeting people with grace to, to meet them where they're at and, um, you know, just offer different avenues to describe these things. And so, um, some of the ways that I've tried to do that and using language that acknowledges that an individual is more than the crime they've committed is saying like an individual who's been incarcerated rather than a felon or someone who has committed a violent offense rather than a violent offender. Um, I think that as I have been in community and, and the opportunity to serve many people who share these experiences, more often than not that is the first thing that really begins their path towards gaining back the dignity that they've lost through this experience. Um, and again, that's just my, my personal experience, but I think that's kind of how it starts, is acknowledging that they are people who are more than the worst decision they made in their life. Now, beyond that, are there things that we have to acknowledge and be careful of and aware of? Absolutely. Like, there are things that we do have to pay attention to. There are things that we need to be aware of, struggles that this individual probably is going to have that maybe somebody who didn't have that same experience won't struggle with. Um, I think the most instructive and important thing you can do is just talk about it and just say, hey, can you share with me 
you know, what, what led up to this? And how are you different today as a result of your experience? And, and if you were to work here, how can I come alongside you in overcoming some of the barriers that now exist because you are a person who has a felony record? Um, and just creating that conversation, because right now in so many environments, it's not even talked about. So when somebody misses work because they've got to go drug test once a week or once a month, you know, all of a sudden it's like this person's not showing up. Well, if, if you knew that they've got to take the city bus to get to and from work because they, they have a felony, they can't they have a felony, they can't get their driver's license. They've got to pay, you know, a couple thousand dollars to get their driver's license reinstated. On top of that, they've got three or four thousand dollars in fines and fees. And it's really hard for them to get a job where they can get to and from it while they're still riding the city bus so that they can pay off their fines and fees, so that they can get their driver's license reinstated, so that they can get a job that they can drive to and from. And, you know, oh, by the way, they're still trying to get their kids back and they can't get an apartment because they have a felony, felony conviction on their record. And, you know, I mean, if you were just to sit down and walk through that with somebody and then ask yourself, were I in that same position? Were it not for things that I was given in my life that led to me having the opportunities that I, that I have today, how would I deal with that? And I think that just brings us to a level playing field of empathy that says, like, all right, if our intent is to play whatever role we have in our community to work towards a solution, and that happens to be by employing someone who has a felony conviction, how can we start from a place of empathy and come alongside them in their journey towards becoming a productive member of society? Mm -hmm. The last part was, you know, is it better to, to focus right now on the individuals who are currently incarcerated or, or potentially do something on the front end? And again, just another incredibly hard question. Um, and there's really no, there's no easy answer because the reality is we need both. I mean, there's, there's only so much you can do once someone has already been incarcerated, especially for individuals that we would describe are low risk, so individuals that have committed property crimes or drug crimes, um, compared to someone who might be high risk who's committed a violent crime and demonstrated by own history. Um, once an individual who's low risk has been incarcerated, their likelihood of becoming higher risk on the back end has already begun. That's already, that, the instance of incarceration has already begun that process. So yes, we need those resources while they're incarcerated. We need those resources on the back end. Um, we need, we need, uh, we've got so many phenomenal nonprofits in Oklahoma City providing these services. We need more of them. Um, I would also say that the, the state is doing an incredible amount of work to address these needs on the back end. We need, we need more resources for those things. And, and again, this is where we as a community, we have to have a conversation. So what are we prioritizing? Right now, we prioritize close to half a billion dollars to our state Department of Corrections, and you know we we as a community long term have to have a conversation about how much more. I mean, and I would say we probably need more there now because we have the highest we have the highest inmate to staff ratio in the country. Our correctional officers are underpaid, they're overworked. It's an incredibly dangerous job. They perform small miracles every day just getting home from work. I mean, it's it's an incredibly difficult environment to be working in, but. As a community, we've got to have a conversation. Where do these resources need to go? Are there better alternatives? And then, yes, on the front end, I mean, you know, the state of Texas was incentivized by the legislature to create alternative programming for counties that have more than 100,000 100, people. And so they had the resources to, to do that. We don't have the resources right now to do that, but I think that's a conversation we can begin. And how do you implement something like that on a local basis where judges and prosecutors and public defenders are getting together to come up with those solutions for their localities to say, here's the best alternative program given our context that will help us divert the most people from prison and give them the things that they actually need. So um, it's a really hard balance to strike. And with a problem as significant as I would say this is, you could even go back even earlier and say, what are we doing in our school system? How is education? A part of this. How how are uh, how is DHS and our foster care system a part of this? How is uh, you know all these different societal things that that end up in many ways putting people you probably heard the, the term pipeline in this direction. And at what points uh, we've we've heard the analogy before. So right now it seems like a lot of times we're just pulling people out of the river. And at some point we've got to stop and ask the question like who's pushing these people in or where are they jumping in? And how can we go upstream and figure out what the, what's the solution there, rather than spending so much time and energy on just pulling them out and, and giving them CPR and bringing them back to life? Let's let's take a second and take a step back and figure out what's happening upstream. So I think that's that's where I find hope and encouragement is that we're having that conversation now. And and my hope and belief is that as a community we're moving towards an eventuality where we will have a plan where we're talking about what's happening upstream, and we'll have to have hard conversations about how do we fund things like that. How do we have the political capital and, and 
talk about the issues that aren't always really palatable or popular to talk about. We're going to have to have hard conversations about that in order to make sustainable long-term change that I think we need. I'm going to wrap us up, but what he just said right there at the end is the perfect wrap-up, and he focused on hope. Uh, when we come together for these times, it's not always going to be a light topic. Sometimes we have to uh, go to the deeper uh, conversations to be able to experience the changes that we want. But I want to acknowledge this, and that is a product of a culture. And I want to just acknowledge that um, we can do this, and we can get there from here. And I just want to say thank you to uh, Adam. I've known Adam long enough to know that his passion is people, and it, uh, the politics part is not the point. It's how do you help people. And I want to just acknowledge that uh, on, on his behalf and say thank you, Adam, for your service.